subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello, dear learner, and welcome to Senior High School uh, on Joy Learning Television. I'm so excited to be here with another lesson on physics for SHS1. Ane Kwabi Albert is my name, and I'm going to be your facilitator. All right, so we are going to look at physics for Senior High School Year 1, and our topic for discussion is dynamics. Dynamics. So, by the end of today's lesson, or this session, I would want you to be able to explain the concept of inertia. The concept of inertia. Then, you should be able to state Newton's three laws of motion. So, Newton, the scientist, has three laws of motion. We're going to discuss all those laws so you should be able to state all those laws after the end of the lesson or by the end of the lesson and then give at least two applications in daily life. Also, you should be able to explain the concept of momentum and change in momentum. So you follow as we go through the lesson. At the end of the lesson, you should know what momentum is and explain the concept of momentum even to a friend, then you should be able to define impulse and tell the relationship between impulse and momentum. Good. So I am sure you are going to have a very nice time and get your books, get your pens ready so that we can set the ball rolling. Now, for our introduction, dynamics is a branch of mechanics. So you have a broader topic a broader branch, which is mechanics. And under mechanics, you have dynamics. So it's a branch of mechanics. It falls under mechanics. And here, what we are going to learn, or we are going to look at, is movement of bodies. So motion of bodies. And the bodies will not just get up and move on their own. Something must cause the bodies, or the body to move. And that is a force must be applied. So here, we are going to consider bodies that are in motion and the forces that are causing the motion. And as we study that, we say we are studying dynamics. So, an external force will cause a body at rest to move. That is one thing a force can do. So when you are asked to define a force, you could say a force is anything that can change a body's state of rest. So the body is at rest, it can cause it to move. Or a body in motion to stop or change direction or even move faster. So the force will be anything that can cause a body at rest to change its state of rest. Or if the body is in motion, it can cause it to stop moving or change its direction. And that will be a force. So the force can cause the body to change the direction of motion, or it can cause it to even move faster, or it can even cause the body to slow down its movement. Now, let us take this scenario. You have a car parked, okay? And maybe the driver has put the car on a neutral gear. Now you'd want to move this car. You'd want to push the car. But you try pushing the car, and the car is not moving. In other words, the car is offering a resistance to motion. So the car, you're trying to push it, but then it is not trying to move. Or you have a sofa at home, the one you sit in to watch television. Now, you try to push it a little bit because maybe something had fallen under it. You try to push the sofa and it is not moving. That means it is offering a resistance to the motion. That is what we call inertia. Inertia. Or 
you have, let's say, a football. If you've been following matches, when there is a free kick, a player stands behind the ball and he kicks the ball over a human wall. Sometimes the ball goes over the human wall. The goalkeeper tries to catch the ball. His hands might touch the ball, yet the ball enters the net. So the goalkeeper is trying to stop the motion or the movement of the ball. But the ball is reluctant to stop. So it resists that stoppage by the goalkeeper and now moves into the net. Now this is what we call inertia. The reluctance of a body to move when it is at rest. So the body is at rest. You try to push it to change its state of rest, but it doesn't want to move. It offers a resistance. That is inertia. Or if the body is in motion, now you're trying to stop it from moving. And then it says, no, I don't want to stop moving. It keeps moving. When this happens, we say inertia is at play. So we define inertia as the reluctance of a body to move if it is at rest. The reluctance of a body at rest to move or stop if it is already in motion or stop if it is already in motion so if the body is in motion it feels reluctant to stop that reluctance of the body to stop if it is in motion is called inertia now we can also define inertia as the tendency the tendency of an object to resist changes, to resist changes in a state of rest or motion. So the tendency of the object, the object has a tendency to resist a change of its state at rest or its state of rest or a change of its state of motion. So the, the, the body is at rest then it doesn't want to stop resting. It wants to sit wherever it is, stay there and not move. So although you try to apply a force to it, it does not easily move. It is offering a reluctance. Or the body is already in motion and you are trying to stop it from moving. But it doesn't want to stop. It continues, it tries to resist that tendency to cause it to stop. And we are saying that that is called inertia. So the tendency of an object to resist changes in a state of rest or motion. Good. In that case, let's look at factors that affect the inertia of a body. What do you think will cause a body to try not to move although you try to push it? Or to try not to stop although you've made an effort to stop it. One, the mass of the body. The mass of the body. If the body has a huge mass, it's quite big and it's quite heavy, when you try lifting, when you try pushing it, it will take a lot of effort to do that pushing or lifting. So the bigger the mass of the body, the higher its inertia. A body with a big mass will prove difficult to move. So it's very difficult to push, to move a body with a big mass. Then we look at the speed of the body. In the case of the example of the football that has been kicked, if you kick the ball and there's no power behind it, it's moving quite slowly it's very easy for the goalkeeper to catch the football. But if you kick it with a lot of power, you apply high, so much force to it, and you kick the football, the goalkeeper tries to catch it. He might try to hold it with the hands, but the ball will still or may still slip through the hands and enter the goal post. In that case, the speed of the ball is the reason for which the goalkeeper is unable or was unable to catch it. So when the body is moving with a higher velocity or a higher speed, it will be very difficult
to stop it from moving. So these are some of the factors that affect the inertia of a body. I think that by now you should be thinking through what will be another factor that will affect the inertia of a body. What should the body have so that it will resist motion or when it is already in motion, it will resist being stopped. You should be able to find one or two factors for yourself. Good. So, having built this foundation, we can start looking at Newton's laws of motion. Note that under kinematics, we were able to look at Newton's equations of motion. This one is different from Newton's equations of motion. Newton's laws of motion are different from the Newton's equations of motion. So try and pay attention so you can know the difference between the laws and the equations. So we go with the first law, Newton's first law of motion. It says that a body at rest will remain or will be at rest. So if I have a body and it's at rest, it will remain or be at rest. And that is true. You have a body at rest. And so you apply any external force to it, ideally, it is supposed to remain at rest. Then it goes ahead to say that, or if in motion, or if in motion, will continue its linear motion with a uniform velocity. So, in the other case, if the body should be moving, then we expect the body to move in a straight path. That's what we mean by linear motion. So, the body should move in a straight path or a straight line. It should move describing a straight line with a uniform velocity. With a uniform velocity. Then it says, unless an external force acts on it to change its state. Unless an external force acts on it to change its state. So, if an external force acts on this body which is at rest, or on this body which is moving in a straight path, then there will be a change in state of the body. And I think the law really holds, and it really makes a lot of sense. So, Newton's first law of motion says a body at rest will remain or will be at rest. Or if it is in motion, will continue its linear motion with uniform velocity unless an external force acts on it to change its state. And that is Newton's first law of motion. You could see that the first law that we are looking at now is very synonymous to inertia that we just discussed. That the body is at rest and would want to be at rest and tries to resist motion. Or the body is moving and would want to continue moving, so tries to resist stoppage. So, because this particular law is very similar to inertia, sometimes we refer to Newton's first law as the law of inertia, as the law of inertia. So, sometimes Newton's first law of motion is also called Newton's law of inertia. So, in an examination, when you are asked to state Newton's law of inertia, mind you, it is the same as Newton's first law of motion. Now, let's look at effects of Newton's first law and inertia. The first law is telling us that if you have a body that is at rest, it will remain at rest. If you have a body that is moving in a straight path, it would want to continue moving in that straight path with a constant velocity unless we apply an external force to the body. Have you noticed that sometimes when you are in a vehicle and then the driver is probably speeding, usual or normal speed, and comes to a curve or a bend 
and it's not able to really slow down. So the driver negotiates the bend at an average or at a speed. The passengers in the car also sway. Their bodies move or tilt to one side of the body of the car. That is it. And we are saying that that is an effect of the first law. So the passengers would want to move in a straight path as they were going on the road. But because the driver turned on, took the turn or the bend, and the bodies are used to moving straight, they also sway to one side of the vehicle. So passengers in the vehicle moving at a steady speed in a straight path sway. They sway to one side of the vehicle when the driver suddenly negotiates a bend. That is one effect of Newton's first law and inertia. So here the inertia part is that the passengers are reluctant not to move in a straight path. They feel like no, even though the car is taking a bend, they still want to move in a straight path, which is not really possible. So their bodies then sway to one side of the vehicle. Now, the next one, I'm sure most of us might have experienced this before. You are in a vehicle and the driver is moving probably at a high speed. Then all of a sudden, the car has to stop because probably, probably another vehicle just came to cross you, that your vehicle. And the driver wouldn't want to hit that vehicle for an accident too. Okay. So the driver applies the brakes suddenly. What happens? You jerk forward as a passenger and then backwards in your seat. So you move forward and then you come backwards. That's one reason for which we say when you are in the front seat in a vehicle or in a car, put on your seat belt. And even if you are in the back seat and seat belts are available, put on your seat belt because if the driver should apply the brake suddenly because of the first law and inertia, you would jerk forward from your seat. And if the driver was moving at a very high speed, your jerking forward can throw you off the seat and then you are heading towards the windscreen. And that would be fatal. But if you are in your seat belt, it means that the seat belts will hold you glued to the seat. So you see, you have to apply these things in your daily lives. So passengers in the vehicle jerk forward in their seats when the driver applies the brakes suddenly to stop. And this is due to the first law and inertia. So I believe that you have come to understand Newton's first law of motion and how it applies to our everyday lives. So you can try and find out other events, other activities that take place because, or that happened because of the first law and inertia. Before we move on to Newton's second law of motion, we have to look at what we call momentum. So momentum, for this purpose, P is a symbol to represent momentum. Now, the momentum of a body is the product of the mass of the body and its velocity. That is to say that if I want to find the momentum of a body, I'm supposed to multiply the mass of that body by its velocity. So the body must be in motion to have that momentum. So you multiply the mass by the velocity. Therefore, mathematically, momentum will be equal to mass. So if I have momentum to be P, so P will be equal to the mass M times the velocity V. And that will be momentum. So momentum is the product of mass and velocity. Therefore, M times V. So we, the SI unit for momentum will be a combination of the units of mass and velocity. So the unit of mass gives us the kilogram. So for mass, the unit will give us kilogram. And for velocity, the unit will be meter per second. So the two of them gives us this that you have here. Kilogram 
meter per second. And that becomes the unit for momentum. Let's quickly look at change in momentum. What do you mean by change in momentum? Let us take a scenario. Let's say I have a body here. So this is my body. Let me change my color so it will give us some difference. So I have a body. Then let's say I've got a mass M. Now it's moving with a velocity U. So M is the mass and U is the initial initial velocity with which the body is moving. U is the initial velocity with which the body is moving. So now, if I want the momentum of the body, it will be called the initial momentum of the body. So initial momentum There will be, we have said that momentum is the product of mass and velocity. But now it is the initial velocity. So it becomes mass times the initial velocity. So m times u, which will be the same as mu. Let's say when the body was, has been in motion for some time, it was kicked. And the external force caused the body to now move maybe faster. So I still have the body. With the same mass, but now it has a new velocity v, which is the final velocity. So now I can find the final momentum. In that case, or in this case, the final momentum too will be the product of the mass and the final velocity, which becomes m v. So. Let me say delta P is my symbol for change in momentum. Therefore, change in momentum will give me the initial momentum, sorry, the final momentum. So final momentum minus the initial momentum. And that will give us mv minus mu. Simplify that to be to get m into bracket v minus u. So that gives us the change in momentum. m into bracket v minus u. The final momentum minus the initial momentum. Now take note that in this case, the change in momentum is a loss because it is final velocity minus initial velocity. A minus sign here giving us that there is a loss. But there's what we call a rebound. A rebound. In the case of a rebound, in the case of a rebound, the change in momentum is a gain and not a loss. So instead of now I have change in momentum like this to be delta P equals MV minus MU, which we got as M into V minus U. That was a change in momentum. And this is a loss. So in the case of a rebound, then a change in momentum will now become m into v plus u. The way the question will be framed will make you know that there is a rebound. And in the case of a rebound, the change in momentum is going to be again and not a loss. So you could read around those lines. Now we are good to look at Newton's second law of motion because we have come to know momentum. And the second law has something to do with momentum. Now it says that the change in linear momentum. So linear momentum is very important here. 
Why? Because there is also angular momentum. So this particular law applies to linear momentum. The change in linear momentum of a body with time, with time, is directly proportional to the force applied. Directly proportional to the force applied and takes place in the same direction of the applied force. Let's take it again. The change in linear momentum of a body with time is directly proportional to the force applied and takes place in the same direction of the applied force. That is Newton's second law of motion, which you have to commit into memory because you could be asked to state it and you should be able to state it. The change in linear momentum of a body with time. So it could be the rate of change of linear momentum. That's the same as the change in linear momentum of a body with time. Is that proportional to the applied force, to the force applied? And it takes place in the direction of the applied force. So we can get a mathematical expression for this law. You can try and get an expression mathematically for this law. It says that the change in linear momentum, which will be, if it is linear momentum, then we have the mass times the change in velocity. That becomes a change in linear momentum because we just looked at change in momentum. Now, it says that with time, so this is a change in momentum, which is change in linear momentum, with time. So, with time. So, T becomes my time. And we're saying it's proportional. It's, it is very proportional to the force applied. So, I bring my sign of proportionality, and F is my force. So, F is our force applied we know m to be mass we know v and u to be final and initial velocities so t is time so the whole of newton's second law of motion can be expressed mathematically as this f is proportional very right, proportional to m into v minus u over t. Now, we take away the sign of proportionality, then we bring an equal to sign and introduce a constant. So, f will be equal to, then the constant, m into v minus u all over t. So, you have that. Then, what next? From experiments, the constant is found to be 1. So k is equal to 1. If k is equal to 1, then we go there and put that into the expression. And it becomes f is equal to now m into v minus u all over t. This expression you have here sums up everything for Newton's second law of motion. So we have the change in linear momentum, which is m into v minus u, with time, so over t, is directly proportional to the force applied, which is f. And it takes place in the direction of the force. Now, let's go to our previous lesson on kinematics and pick or borrow an uh, uh, idea or borrow some knowledge. We know that change in velocity with time is acceleration. That is to say that V minus U all over T is A where A is equal to acceleration. Acceleration of the body. So in that case, 
the above expression now becomes f is equal to mass times acceleration and technically this f should have been f r which is equal to m a where f r is equal to resultant force resultant force so you see from newton's second law of motion we can show that resultant force fr is equal to mass times acceleration mass times acceleration so these are some mathematical formula we can come across or we can coin out of newton's second law of motion good now what can we deduce from this second law of motion just from or just from the expression which is f is equal to m into v minus u all over t just from this expression we can make some deductions looking at the expression the force is directly proportional to the change in linear momentum which is m into bracket v minus u so i could say that the force directly proportional to m into v minus u but the force is inversely proportional to the time so we can say that the force and the time are inversely proportional so we can say that when there is a decrease in the time in this case the force applied is going to be high now what are we trying to say when there is a change in linear momentum m into v minus u within a short time a smaller time the force exerted will be high we can deduce that from the expression let's take it again when there is a change in linear momentum which is the numerator when there's a change here good in linear momentum that's a numerator within a short time because the time and the force applied are inversely proportional when this change up here happens within a short time the force that will be exerted will be very high so it means that in practice you don't change momentum within a short time other than that you are going to have a high force being exerted either on you or on another body let's take an example look at high jumpers they get back at a good distance they run now the high jumper has a mass he starts running so he has a velocity so mass times change in the velocity he's moving that is change in linear momentum so he runs and then jumps over a bar once he's jumping over the bar in front of the bar they have a mattress there why they don't want him to change the momentum with a short time so he lands on the mattress but doesn't really land once it takes him time for the legs to press onto the mattress others even lie or roll on the mattress so that it will prolong the time within which the athlete or the high jumper will stop then the force that he will exert on the mattress and the mattress that will also exert on him will be less so he jumps up changing momentum force on the mattress it takes him time to roll or move on the mattress before he finally stops so the time is prolonged then the force that he will exert on the mattress or the mattress will exert on him will be less because the change in momentum occurred within a longer time so if you are watching a movie and somebody jumps from a car a moving car a speeding car and lands on the ground and stops that is practically not true because in that case the person has moved is has moved from a moving vehicle he has changed momentum but stopped suddenly so the momentum was changed or within a short time 
So he's going to exert a very high force on the ground. And the ground too will exert a high force on him because it will be action and reaction. And in that case, the person is likely to get hurt. So these are some of the things that you're supposed to not just learn them for academic work, but for the sake of, of your everyday life situations. So you try to change your momentum within a longer time so that you exert less force and then you are good to go. So think of some other things that we do that we try to help people change momentum within a, short, a, a, a longer time so that they won't exert any high force on themselves or on other bodies and not get hurt. Good. Now we can move on to Newton's third law. It's one of the, I think, most, most famous of all the, of the laws. And it's saying that to every action, there is a reaction equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. So to every action, there's a reaction. So I do say action and reaction are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. So to every action, there's a reaction equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. Some people say if you throw a ball to a wall, it bounces to you. So it comes back to you. And they say the harder you throw it, the harder it comes back to you. That is Newton's third law. So you can just take a tennis ball, you drop it on a hard surface, it hits the surface, it comes back. So your action is the dropping of the ball. The reaction is it hits and comes back to you. So action and reaction are equal in, in magnitude but opposite in, in direction. And that is Newton's third law of motion. What are some of the effects and applications of Newton's third law of motion. We can look at one, the proportion of a rocket. The proportion of a rocket, the forward movement of a rocket, high, 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 high up into space. It is an application of Newton's third law. Then we can look at the recoil of a gun as it fires a bullet. So you have a gun loaded with a bullet now, as the gun fires the bullet, the bullet moves out at a high speed. Then the barrel of the gun moves backwards towards the one who fired it. So the action is the speed with which the bullet is fired, moves out of the gun. And the reaction is the barrel of the, or the base of the gun coming back to the one who fired it. And that is also an effect or an application of Newton's third law. Now, if you can swim, then you can attest to this. Or if you don't know how to swim, you watch people who swim, especially during the Olympic Games. You would see that a swimmer jumps into the water and now uses the hands and even the feet to try and beat or move the water current backwards. And as the swimmer tries to move the water backwards his body is propelled forward and that is an application of newton's third law so the action of the swimmer trying to beat the water bodies to go or the water current to come backwards and then the reaction is that he in turn gets his body moved forward so the backward pushing of water by a swimmer and the reaction that pushes the swimmer forward that is also an application of the Newton's third law of motion. These applications are not exhaustive. You can get other applications in your textbooks. So for further reading, try and get two more applications of Newton's third law. Make sure that in your applications, there are or there is an action. Then there should also be a reaction. And it should be that the action and the reaction are equal in magnitude, but they should act in opposite directions. Good. So, to further explain what we're talking about, that the proportion of a rocket 
It's an application of Newton's third law. You're saying in a rocket, it has got a compartment where there is fuel. Just like in a car, where you have to put fuel in the car for burning to take place. The same way in a rocket, it's a place where there should be fuel. The fuel could be hydrogen, it could be oxygen. Then the fuel is mixed with compressed liquid oxygen and it is burnt. So the burning takes place. And as the mixture burns, hot gas at high temperature and pressure goes out. It's expelled through the exhaust at the back or at the bottom part of the rocket. And as these hot gases move out with high pressure at very high velocities, the rocket is driven, it's propelled, it's moved at that same higher or high velocity upwards in the opposite direction. So we can take this picture you can see here. So that's our rocket. And you can see the exhaust of the rocket, the back there, where the burning is taking place, is the exhaust. So the hot gases are coming out from the exhaust at high pressure. Then, in turn, the rocket is moved, is propelled to go upwards. You see the beauty of, of science and the beauty of we applying what we have learned to make life enjoyable. So people got to know of action and reaction and then chose to put that into practice. And there we are. So the movement of the rocket, you have the burning gases coming out from the exhaust and in turn propels the rocket to move upwards in the opposite direction. That's quite beautiful. Now, you are saying that when you have a swimmer pushing backwards the water in the pool or in the river or water body, he in turn is pushed forward. So we can look at this picture. So you can see this could be a race and you can see the swimmer. And look at the arms. So you see where this hand is and where that hand is. So she moves one forward, it pulls the water backwards and takes another hand forward to pull the water or push the water backwards. And as the swimmer does that, he or she, or this time it's a she now, so she's able to now move forward. So the action part is the beating of the water backwards and the reaction part is the forward movement of the swimmer. And so these are applications of Newton's third law of motion and you need to read more on these applications. So this is another swimmer. He's also moving, trying to beat. So you can see the other hand cannot be seen in this case because it's inside the water, trying to beat it backwards. Then there's the one on top also going to move and take the water backwards again so that there will be an action and reaction causing the swimmer to move forward. So, we have been able to exhaust our objectives for our lesson today. I believe that at the end of this lesson, or by now, you should have been able to explain in your own words the concept of inertia. Inertia being the, the reluctance of a body at rest to move or to stop when it is in motion. Then you should be able to state Newton's laws of motion. The first law which says that the body at rest will remain at rest. But if it is in motion, it will continue its linear motion with a constant velocity unless an external force acts on it, causes it to act otherwise. The second law says that the change in linear momentum of a body with time is directly proportional to the force applied, and it takes place in the direction of the applied force. 
the third law says action and reaction are equal in magnitude but opposites in direction. We've looked at momentum. We said momentum is the product of the mass of a body and its velocity. And change in momentum will only be the difference between final momentum and initial momentum. Then we looked at impulse. Look at impulse. So what we are going to look at now is impulse. What is impulse? What is impulse? Now, impulse is simply the product of force and time. So I have impulse. We are saying impulse, which I can use I to represent is the product of force and time. So I can say impulse I is equal to force times time. So if force is F and time is T, to represent that, I'm going to get I equals FT. So in that case, the SI unit for impulse will be the units of force and time, which would be Newton second. Now, we are looking at how does impulse relate to momentum. Let's go back to Newton's second law of motion. Mathematically, that law gave us F is equal to M into V minus U all over T. So to make this linear, I'm going to get Ft is equal to m into v minus u. We just agreed or arrived that Ft, force times time, is impulse. So in place of this force times time here, I can say i is equal to m into v minus u. What is m into v minus u? That is change in momentum. So in other words, impulse is also equal to change in momentum. So in this case, the unit for impulse will be equal to kilogram meter per second. Kilogram for the mass, meter per second for the change in momentum. So, how does impulse relate to momentum? Impulse is equal to change in momentum. It's been an interesting time with you. I think you would also need to sit and go over what we have gone through so that in the next lesson, we will build upon what we have discussed. It's been Senior High School R on Joy Learning Television. We've gone through physics for senior high school one. And then Pabi Albert is my name. I've been your facilitator. I hope to come your way another time with a very insightful lesson. So until we meet again, keep doing what you have been doing and be consistent. It's bye-bye for now. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.